Hi there, Linda here with another look at how to write nonlinear story material. This time I'm looking at the use of flashback in the Netflix TV serial The Serpent, which is based on the true story of Charles Sabrage, who in the 1970s murdered backpackers in Bangkok, Kathmandu and, and stole their possessions and passports. He was the most extraordinary psychopath, but also apparently charismatic. As always, my reason for analysing this story is so that we as writers know how to structure it. It's not literary criticism or narratology, it's how you write it. It's the practical mechanics, the engineering, how it's put together, how the writer you know, got away with doing <laughs> something very complicated and how we can learn from it and you know, copy that structure. As you may already know, The Serpent uses a very complex flashback structure. It uses two sorts of flashback and does some interesting new things with them. Okay. Um, now, there isn't the room here for in-depth, scene-by-scene, deep dive, uh, you know, deep dive into the serpent as I've done in webinars on unorthodox and uh, how to use stru the structure of Pulp Fiction as a five-part uh, TV series. It, it's just some observations about how the serpent conforms and doesn't conform to my structural explanations. Uh, and, and analyses of, of flashback and if you, how you actually do it. So if you're new to my channel, you might want to look at the videos I've done on the nine families of flashback. Um, yes, there are nine. <laughs> and that's just one family, the six nonlinear multiple storyline uh, structures you need to learn. And this is about how you structure them. I'll give you links below. So don't panic. The great thing to remember about all kinds of nonlinear structure at the moment is that the content of your story, the type of nonlinear multiplot story you want to tell, will normally be one of the six types of parallel narrative, uh, stru the structural models that I've isolated, or a hybrid type combination, or a combination of types. All right, so that's a great thing to know actually. So let's get back to the serpent complex, yes. But actually, it's combining two standard types of flashback structure and modifying them. The first structure is used for the story of Sabrage's murders and thefts, the crime. And I'll come back to the second in a moment. So this, this first structure is one I've isolated and named case history flashback. These are the crimes. And so it's, it's in case history flashback. It's the form of Citizen Kane. So the story content of case history flashback is always the same. It always starts in the present, or what we think is the present, and is always about an enigmatic outsider with a mysterious background being investigated by another character who, who, who wants to find out the truth about the enigmatic character's past. They're often sort of shady characters. So in The Serpent, the enigmatic outsider with a mysterious background is Sabrage himself, and the investigator figure is a Dutch diplomat. You see what I mean? Like Citizen Kane. Now, the structure of case history flashback, the structure that helps you tell this sort of story, um, is as follows. There are two complete storylines, one in the past and one in the present, and the story in the past is told in flashbacks. Think of Citizen Kane, okay? So the film or TV pilot episode will open on a crucial moment in the, the enigmatic um, character's present, which in, Kane, in, in Kane's case, since he's dead, and then it'll flash back to the start of that person's story in the past. Now, the film or TV series episode will then jump between past and present, uh, giving us flashbacks in chronological order. Now, that's important. They tell the story of the past, chronological order. So in standard case history flashback, that opening scene or sequence from the outsider's present will trigger the involvement of the investigator figure and start that investigator's story in the present. So in Citizen Kane, the triggering crisis is Kane's death, and that triggers the involvement of the journalist. You see? You see the similarity? For that reason, I call that trigger scene or sequence the triggering crisis, because it's a crisis that triggers the story in the present. It's got an important structural function, which you need to know. Firstly, because it gives us an intriguing hook, it creates a mystery and, uh, and feeds the binge, you know, so people will come back. Secondly, it ties the investigator and the enigmatic outsider together. It connects their two stories, so you're not just randomly, you know, sticking in flashbacks. You're explaining it one to the other. Technically, the function of case history flashback is to hold the series or the film together and keep us watching to find out what the puzzling scene is about. 
it does this in the serpent. So that overarching structure is sort of the, the series arc, actually. So where does the serpent depart from standard case history? Firstly, it's in the way the flashbacks are done. They're done in a flashback type that I've named catch-up flashbacks. Catch-up flashbacks are used most famously in Memento. You remember Memento? You know those flashbacks in that? We first see the end of an event in the past, then later we see its start. Now, in Memento, the end of the sequence and the start are back-to-back. -back. In other films and TV series, the two halves are shown separately. They're separate in The Serpent. Now, in The Serpent, they appear with dateline captions like, you know, three months before and three months later or four months before and so on. Now, I'm not sure <laughs> whether the catch-up flashbacks in The Serpent are shown in chronological order because I didn't read them closely. I found I didn't feel the need. I could pick up where we were chronologically um, you know, just from the action. So the dateline captions just for me, just alerted me to the arrival of a new flashback and that was sufficient. Now it's surprising that this could hold. I mean, really, seriously. I mean, that said, I gather some people hated the catch-up flashbacks. Now, and maybe uh, not needing the captions and not being worried by the, the catch-up flashbacks, you know, was just me, just only my response. But if we can actually create catch-up flashbacks without having dateline clues, and not having them back to back. I mean, that's astonishing. So is the answer here that complicated catch-up flashbacks work if the content is right? Of course, the big if here is getting the right content. The wrong content, and my guess is you'd be catches. So you'd have to choose which flashbacks you're jumping between, okay, and how you split them up. So, okay, so the, the second way that the serpent departs from the norm of case history flashback is in the triggering crisis. Now, normally the triggering crisis scene as I've said, is, is at the very end of the enigmatic outsider. Think of Citizen Kane as dead, you know. But case history always has a twist at the end. That's the definition. It always has this sort of twist. Now, you remember Citizen Kane, where the journalist was trying to find out the secret of Kane's last words, Rosebud, this is what the whole, you know, all, talking to all these people. And in the end, we, the audience, find out what it is, but the journalist doesn't. He never finds it out. And we never, and we, the audience, we never really know why Kane said it. No? Well, the twist in the serpent is twofold. Firstly, the triggering crisis is not at the end of the outsider's story. There's a very important and mystifying set of events afterwards, after that opening scene, which is a surprise, it's a twist. T Secondly, the investigator character, just Dutch diplomat, starts investigating not as a result of that opening scene, you know, where, where um, uh, Sabraj being interviewed, but much earlier in the Sabraj story, at another crisis moment, the story, discovery of two corpses whose bodies had been half burnt. He went on to kill more, but it was the investigator character just came in at that point. So, just a final note on the matter of flashbacks here. People have been writing to me wondering whether the flashbacks were written in or left until the editing. My hunch is that they were written. I've had no idea. But I would always recommend creating your own structures, linear or non-linear. Now, don't give it to somebody else. You know, film editors, the unsung heroes of the industry, they're often brilliant. They've often got a brilliant understanding of structure. Also, there are directors who have structural mastery. But not all film editors and directors are created equal. Now, my personal rule is never hand over creative control to an unknown person because <laughs> sometimes to a known person because, you know, that uh, can be disastrous. And, and I've seen a number of scripts and films where the flashbacks have been left until post-production and someone has insert, inserted a random exciting scene involving, you know, an unimportant character or, you know, put in an intriguing bit of voiceover unconnected with the main theme just to provide a bit of energy. Problem was that the audience, uh, you know, felt that those insertions were meant the characters or the bit of voiceover were central. I mean, why wouldn't you? Um, you must you thought they were important, so the audience was waiting for these characters or the you know the philosophical voiceover bit to be relevant, to be important, and of course you know in so doing they actually missed the entire point of the film. The film or script fell flat; it failed, which is awful. So the point here, here is your flashbacks or voice must be crucial clues. You don't just insert for energy because it just doesn't work. Watch the serpent to see what I mean about the use, good use of flashbacks. Actually break it down for yourselves. Break it down scene by scene in detail, more than I've done here. Particularly break down those catch-up flashbacks. See if they're in chronological order. If not, 
analyze why they work. I'll try to do it myself at some point. Now, by the way, I've just started running online courses in TV writing in my own online course. It's a course platform. It's entitled Secrets of the Writer's Room because there's an awful lot that goes on in the writer's room, what writers do that other people just are not familiar with. I'll be providing actual courses on nonlinear uh, and flashback there when I get around to it. It's all about the actual tricks of the writing trade, how you actually construct this difficult stuff. <laughs> See the links below uh, for details. I hope this was useful to you. If so, please subscribe so I know there's somebody out there watching this stuff. Until next time, bye for now. Okay, bye-bye.